person uh, currently uh, showing the presentation? Is it clear yes, to all? Yes, yes. You can see it. Okay. So today's lecture is regarding the technical report writing and communication as well. Hi, my name is Engineer Ahmad uh, Omar. And as uh, I'm, I'm being pleasured by Dr. Uh, Unaib Ghazar that I've been his uh, student for the past few years at the University of Bahrain, finishing my master's degree in civil engineering. And uh, this is a small uh, bio about me. I have received my bachelor's from Prince Mohammed bin Fahd University in Saudi Arabia, a uh, batch of 2017. And then I have moved forward uh, same year to UOB so that I can complete my master's. In terms of work, I have had uh, the opportunity to work with the World Bank organization for one year uh, regarding environmental researches. Then I currently work at Al Fala Contracting for, uh, as a lead civil engineer, specifically for Aramco, Saudi Aramco related uh, construction projects. My main current uh, project right now is a school for Aramco, considering many uh, items and facilities as well. Uh, I'm very glad today to share with you some of my thoughts about uh, technical report writing and communication. And our agenda today will be will include some introductions about the topic as well as some of the classifications of technical report writing and communications in general, as well as some of the communication mediums that have helped me through the years and currently even as well uh, to communicate the ideas and present them. And we'll then end up by having a small summary uh, for all. To start with the introduction, according to the University of Sussex that Technical reports are a formal form of reports that express some kind of technical information in one way or another in a clear and easily accessible matter. Uh, it usually comes in a system of sections or chapters. This is basically a form of uh, um, like a document or some form of information that's presented for people with a specific needs for some kind of task. Like for example, when uh, our great students, they start research, some of them have questions in some sort of topic or subject. This is where we start looking into research papers and technical report writing in a form of a formal uh, report and how to express those concerns and those technical items that we uh, seek. Uh, again, also, um, in terms of work, practically, I like this definition better. It's basically technical report writing is a way to present facts and conclusions, designs of projects, specifications, concepts, graphical illustrations of design data in a form of a strict organizational matter that whoever wants to read some kind of information or pick out any specific information that they need, it will be easily for them to find. And I cannot stress enough that communication is the key to personal and career success in all terms of communication. Each one of us is unique. Each one of us have his own way of communicating. But my best uh, suggestion and recommendation is to each and every one of us is that we need to hone and improve our communication skills no matter how old we get no matter how experienced we get it's always the key to solve most of whatever obstacle you ever find to elaborate more on technical uh, communication and reports I would like to uh, invite all of the audience to look at the uh, illustration here. Um, I basically found that we can kind of classify it into two uh, types of categories. The first category being the academic uh, side of writing and the practical side of, work, uh, of writing, which is basically our jobs and works and day-to-day -day uses. Uh, with respect to the academic, we mostly have it into two sections, which are uh, researches and books. 
And in researches, it can come in many different shapes, like for, for example, thesis, your bachelor thesis, my master's thesis, PhD thesis, journal papers, conferences, uh, lectures. All of these items are, can be considered as researches. And according to Google, it can be uh, defined as a systematic investigation for specific some kind of material or resources to prove if it's right or wrong or to come up with a new sorts of conclusion. Basically, it makes us the like research detectives, uh, true seekers or whatever you know you want to call it. But by the end of the day, we research that is this thing possible or not. Is it true or not? What kind of limitations we have? And it's a whole world of um, interesting matters uh, to be in fact uh, being able to do some research. And then again, we have books. Books are basically um, a longer version of those researches in many aspects and strictly in the academic wise. Uh, I'm not talking about, for example, comic books and those sorts of entertainment. But in terms of academic, it's basically a medium of uh, recorded information about a specific subject. And most likely it will be in too much details and it will be uh, visually represented as well as in text format. Regarding the researches, I would like to stress as uh, I've been a previous student and I'll always be a student for science as well as you guys that we have some sorts of, uh, let's say chapters or sections, usually you'll find in any research and they are the title page, abstract, introduction, uh, literature review, methodology results, conclusion and future recommendations. A title page is basically a cover page or the first page that anyone will see. And it includes your information, the topic you've chosen for your research, and some kind of, for example, like uh, the company you work in or the institution you're currently in, it's an informative, uh, let's say, presentation of your information, your personal information and your co-authors, if you have some, to the audience. Going, moving on forward for the abstract, uh, abstract, I would say it's the signature of the research. It's basically the golden summary of whatever you did in the whole of research. You're given a task of doing one paragraph, fully explaining uh, the golden items, uh, the best items you've had and the findings you've did, what you did, what you did, how you did it, and what were your results. Most likely, whenever we go to research any kind of topic, we go on, for example, the internet, we go on to google.com, uh, ResearchGate, or many of the websites available to find certain uh, information. Usually the first thing we'll ever see is an abstract. We read the abstract and we'll look. Does the items of this research fit our needs or not? Because not of, most of us don't have the time or even all of us don't have the time to read each and every single research in order to find if it's good or bad. Most likely the signature item, the thing that will get you the golden medal always and uh, will give the best conclusion ever to any researcher will be in the abstract. Next for the abstract, there will always be the introduction where you will introduce your topic. What kind of items are you planning to give to your audience? How are you going to do it in some sort of matter? What were your causes? Uh, basically introducing your idea and opening our minds as readers and audience uh, with respect to the items. Then you'll get the literature review, which is basically your research into history of the topic you've spoken about. Okay, you have an idea, you like the idea, but what's the point of having an idea and you don't have any concrete, let's say, information or conclusions regarding the, that idea? You're supporting documents. How can you know that your idea is the best out there or it works or it's even true? You have to look into the past. How many people, for example, have tried 
your uh, something close or similar or even your idea uh, have uh, there any been some research for example who have improved it uh, have been there any negative comments criticizing the idea for uh, for instance all of these items are usually researched and gathered in the literature research then moving on with the methodology it's basically the idea of how are you going to do your research what are your steps what are your tools what are your techniques how do you prefer going through the steps going from here and on forward uh, for example are you going to use the books uh, and old researches to come up with something new or do you have for example an interesting experiment that you want the world to know about the audience to know about and uh, to impress uh, the audience regarding the way that you're going to reveal or investigate the subject that you're really interested in all sorts of tools and everything should be mentioned in the methodology tools whatever you're using it's always will be a part in the description of the methodology then we have the results you have research items you have now a concrete idea about what you're going to do or what's happening uh, what's the situation and the status of your topic now comes the important part of presenting your results what have you done what have you found how can it be used uh, maybe what does it mean what are those numbers that you've got to mean how can it make sense how does these graphs for instance represent your uh, numbers like for instance uh, one of my researches was regarding uh, the efficiency and how to reduce for instance the uh, the costs and the um, in terms of municipal solid waste routing and finding out the best routes how to use the best method to find the best routes in order to reduce for example costs of petrol and diesel and uh, the impact, for example, of climate change. For instance, I got uh, that per truck we can have, we can save around $1,000 per year. Okay, uh, in terms of results, it's great, $1,000 per year, but what does it mean? Uh, let's say, for example, this is one truck out of 200 trucks per the company using for the municipal solid waste collection. So multiplying a thousand by 200, that's $200,000 being saved per year. So financially speaking, for, uh, for instance, in terms of the company, they're gaining by saving that much money and investing it in somewhere else. Each and every research will have its own interesting results and how to input those uh, and understand those results it's a part of your objective and it's a part of being uh, creative creative as an author and uh, how that the audience that are hearing your uh, and looking and finding out your results how they will going to use it how it's going to help them in the future which takes us to our next part which is the conclusion and the future uh, recommendations it's like okay now you've made your research you know your plan you've done it and you've gotten the results what else so what does it mean by the end of the day have you revealed some kind of new secret or have you revealed some kind of new item or did you come up with some new science that no one knows about or some kind of reservation that uh, it, it can may it can rock the for example the academic and research world in your uh, field of uh, interest um, and to finalize it after finding all of this and concluding your research and presenting it to whoever your audience is uh, it's always recommended to give some kind of recommendation for people who would like uh, to continue your research in terms of maybe someone found it interesting and they wanted to improve it in some certain way or some certain idea maybe add to it something they can, can reference your research and they can start their own. It's always a network of information that's flowing from one person to the another as quickly as possible. And it makes a ton of difference for everyone. And to move to the second classifications of technical communication writing, which is, let's say, our practical work, our field, 
as a civil engineer, these are some of the documents that have been passed through on and on throughout my years of working as a contractor in construction. For instance, you have the method of statement, which is basically a document that states how the work procedure of any activity you're going to do uh, happens. The client many times would like to ask you, okay, you want to pour concrete. That's good. But how are you going to pour it? What are you going to pour it in? Are you going to pour it in wood or in metal? You want it hard concrete or soft concrete, high strength, low strength? What are you going to do to fulfill my objective? My task, for example, of building uh, a tower or building a villa or whatever the task may be that is given by the client. How are we going to do it? Most of those items are always uh, collected and presented in a document called the method of statement. Then as engineers, we always will have this task, which is giving out daily, weekly, or even monthly reports. Okay, today as an engineer, what were your items that you did? What are your milestones? What are your achievements? What did we do? Did we finish the task that we were supposed to finish? Uh, is the activity ongoing? Is the activity done? How many people you have? How many, for example, labor? How many carpenters? How many steel fixers? How many masons? How many electricians? Where are all of those working? All of these items sometimes are being asked by either your bosses in the same company or by the client. They would like to know, are you actually working? Or you're just like, you know, having fun with their money and by the end of the day, nothing happens. and the guys like paying you and still nothing happens and issues will arise. Then comes the plan and progress reports, which basically explains what are your minor and major milestones. Usually in a project, we put targets and we call them milestones. Let's say for instance, by the end of this month, I need to have poured 1000 meter cubes of concrete. Uh, this, let's say it's a major, but in order to reach this major, we have minor points. Are we ready in terms of formwork, for example, or concrete shuttering? How are we going to cast it? Is my materials ready? Did I receive everything? Is my labors ready? Each and every task, small, small task, uh, we coordinate and we collect and we go through. We can call it, for example, a min minor milestone. This is all to show us where are we? and where are we supposed to go? Then we have the project standards and specifications. Okay, now you have a project, congratulations. You can start construction, but wait, how are you going to do it? Based on what? Uh, as engineers, we have tons of uh, documentations regarding standards and specifications. For instance, here in Saudi Arabia, we have uh, the Saudi building code. It specifies each and every type of material and how to use it and how, how it can be used and how it cannot be used in terms of improving those material. But in the same time, for instance, I'm still in Saudi Arabia, but I work under the, uh, my client is Saudi Aramco and they have their own standards and specifications that I have to follow, which is way more strict than the normal, uh, uh, let's say governmental uh, building code is. So I have to follow those. If I followed any other codes, for example, for example, the, uh, the British code or the Australian code or somewhere else, the Japanese code, each and every standard or specification will be mentioned in one document that you need to read, you need to understand. And sometimes even if, for, for instance, if you aim to be a designer, you'll be the one writing those specifications. You will learn it by heart you will know what are your requirements, what are the uh, client's requirements for you. You will compose that uh, document, you will give it to the construction team so that they can uh, physically start their activities. Each and every standard, each and every specification, like for example, the windows, you need them aluminum, you need them steel, you need them wood, whatever specification or standard you're following, using will be composed into one document, which will be the project standards and specification documents. And based on this, we can continue work. 
And again, I would like to remind you all that these are some of the documents that you face day to day. And there are much, many more, but those are the pro, uh, let's say the, the important ones that you, you can find very easily and very quickly, and you will be following through many times. Then we have the completion and commissioning report. Congratulations. You have finished your construction building. You have finished your factory. You have finished your facility. Then what? How will the con uh, client know that it's done? You'll have to physically test it. You'll have to, uh, for example, open the ACO for the house to know if it's actually cooling or not, if uh, the pipings are well made or not. Uh, for example, lights. Uh, you'll have to show him physically that the lights are working, that your connections are good, that your light, the switch is good, the light bulbs are good, it's up to specifications, it's the correct color. Uh, for instance, like, for example, the client ordered yellow colored bulbs, but you've put for him white to make it cheaper on you, but again, you did not follow his specifications. Whatever the testing methods, whatever the items that the client asks you to do, will be presented in this report in order to complete your project, close it, give it away, and move on. And in terms of also commissioning and working, if it's some kind of facility, for example, like a school building or uh, a store or some kind of factory, how can you work and what are the uh, processes to uh, open the machinery and start the activity? Some of the amazing examples I've had the pleasure and the honor to witness throughout my practical career as a lead civil engineer is, for example, the safety supervisor's awareness emails. Every few weeks, every couple of weeks, every, for example, a new activity, we have uh, safety supervisors at site that would send us a specific email in a very a beautiful manner in very simple English language, which will state, oh guys, be careful. You have this new uh, activity coming up. Uh, take care for your family is important. Uh, they need you, be careful, wear your safety items, wear your safety glasses, wear your safety gloves if needed, safety shoes, be careful of the nails, be careful of the uh, whatever hazards we can find. It's always amazing that how uh, many emails you can get, but still always find a new way to learn more information uh, or maybe something like a reminder of something you already know, but maybe in the terms of the heat of the project you forgot about. Then again, the minutes of meetings for attendees. Each and every week we have a couple of meetings, two, three, four meetings with specific departments or your uh, colleagues, for example, as civil, I have meetings with my counterparts in mechanical and electrical. What are we going to do? What are the topics and the to-do list that we all gather together? We always compose a specific standardized uh, document, which is called minutes of meeting, where we state who are the attendees. For example, Mr. Ahmad, Mr. Muhammad, Mr. Ali, and what are their positions? electrical, mechanical, civil, and then each and every topics with their respected civil, we need to follow up this, we need to pour concrete on this, we need to fix this. Electrical people buying, uh, for example, lights, the line, uh, buying cables, coppers, mechanical fixing their wa drinking water lines. Any coordination we do together is basically in terms of uh, items or to-do lists or tasks, we usually put them in minutes of meeting. And you'll find this in many, many companies, especially in the construction world. Then we have side visits uh, reports during, for example, project bidding. Okay, uh, the company is interested, uh, they tell you that we're interested in this new project. Uh, can you please go and check the site? Uh, you'll go, you'll have a look, maybe take a few pictures and then, with your experience and your creative ideas, how are we going to tackle this project? For instance, is your new project in a neighborhood where there's too many buildings or it's in the desert where there's none? Is it easy for the material and trucks to come pass by easily? 
or it's very difficult because it's either far away or the roads are very small, you cannot pass through. What are the advantages and disadvantages of the space? What are the nearby, for example, facilities, like for example, supermarkets, they make a big difference. If you have a supermarket, if you have a restaurant beside your, uh, uh, your job site, it's easier for you, for the labor, anyone who wants to go and eat something, have a refreshment, it's easy. Unlike the desert where you have to travel hours and hours just to buy a bottle of water. Um, so what are the site conditions? If you start construction tomorrow, who are you going to find, for example, from the neighbors or from any other company or factory, for instance? Is it safe? Is that area safe to do? Or you need to do some kind of uh, activity or some kind of workaround or find an alternative? All of this information which you will go in your visit will be represented uh, in a writing manner and maybe some images to make it more elaborate for the audience, for uh, your bosses, your colleagues to understand, then you'll discuss it. All of this will be in a site visit report. Then again, some of the things, for example, we have the undesirable results investigation and improvement. We have many things called NCRs, which is a non-conformance report. It's a report that basically states that you've done this work either in a matter that it's wrong or it's partially wrong and it needs to be corrected. If you get a lot of those NCRs, the client will start to have a shaky feeling with you, for instance. It's like, are you really doing the job correctly? Are you like, do you understand what you're actually doing? Why are you making too many mistakes? We gather those NCRs, for instance, we speak about them, we issue lessons learned, and what are the uh, lessons learned from those issues? For instance, one of our friends, he just forgot to add a box, for instance, to block out some concrete. Mm -hmm. And the major cause was after we poured and we had the steel, we had to bring machines and jackhammers to just break this blockage area, which took labors, man hours, times, rental, for instance, if we don't have the machines, then it takes, uh, machine hours, rental hours, money, there are consequences. So in order to understand those issues, we investigate and we uh, report to our client or to our bosses regarding an improvement or a way or an alternative for those items. It comes in many different ways of report, but for instance, working under Saudi Aramco, they already provide you with the form on how to fill it. And where are you supposed to, for example, sign uh, the dates on when you can fix it and all those sorts of information. Then there's the feasibility and value study. Uh, are you going to make this, pro is this project worth it by the end of the day? Yes, every project, for instance, uh, you can get some kind of profit. Uh, you can get some kind of uh, reputation, but is it worth it for you? Is it worth your time? money, people, labor, whatever resources you have, is it worth really invest in those? How can you uh, have a better value? How can you improve it? All these of items are in the uh, feasibility and value studies reports. Uh, again, it comes in many sorts of standards and matters. It depends on where you work and what company, uh, what your company prefers to use. Then there's the technical queries. Okay, you have a designer, you have an idea of what you want to do, but then uh, never will you ever find a design that's 100% full or correct. Many times you'll find conflicts, for example, with uh, structural people and civil, with electrical people and their pipings, and mechanical people and their ducts. How are you going to go through each and every one of those? How are you going to, for example, uh, solve those conflicts? Uh, usually we are something called a technical query. It's basically a question asking the designer, okay, we've done this or we've studied your design, but we found this issue in this part of the design. What is your proposed solution? Uh, 
whatever the reply is, sometimes it's acceptable, sometimes it's way too creative out of the mind that it's not even possible to fix. Sometimes that you have to modify a little bit. It's, uh, let's say, it's a, it's a two-way communication. All of these items come in sort, different sorts of uh, documentations. So that's why I cannot stress enough how much that oral and like presenting and writing those reports and having a good language in order to understand uh, making it simple for the people to understand uh, those things are really critical uh, in terms of uh, working academically and in practical world, uh, world as well then we come to the uh, communication medium how do we present our data how can we speak our ideas how can we speak our needs how can we show, how can we record, how can we send and get feedback? So basically, or typically there are three main ways. First is the written reports. Second is the visual presentations. And then sometimes we, we have the third one is posters. Written reports are basic. Piece of paper or for instance, on a computer, you write the report and submit it. All of the important uh, information needed will always be recorded in that piece of paper. And whether it's a page or 10 pages or a hundred or thousands of pages, the, it's a mean for anyone who can, it can be sent to, he can read it and he can identify the item. Then comes the visual presentations. Sometimes, for instance, as we have here in this a great opportunity, having to do a presentation where you speak to people uh, tell them your thoughts, ideas, information, maybe some results you have, some questions you have, some nice information you would like to present. It's always, let's say, a good form of motivation and a good, a good way to make any, uh, to, to make the minds come closer as you'll have many people, maybe different backgrounds sitting in front of you and you'll have to tell them your idea. Maybe there'll be some questions. You will answer them. You will make sure that at least some kind of information from what you would like to be presented for the audience, that it reached them and some kind of improvement or some kind of problem, for instance, have been fixed. Uh, then finally, posters. Uh, posters are mainly uh, written and visual representations in the form of like a big piece of paper maybe like for example a meter by two meter or something it's a main parts uh, we mostly use it in research uh, more than others we usually put the main items of our research in one piece of paper including all graphs and all pictures and uh, we present it in a nicely manner so that when people when the people or the audience or the people interested in our subject when they view it they have a collective idea of what are we doing and what are we aiming to do and what is this research about. It's a different way of uh, communicating the idea, but it's uh, recommended many in many places, especially in conferences where tons and tons of researchers and authors gather in one place to discuss a specific topic or a specific subject. Posters are a quick way and to these communications and where you can present everything quickly and uh, people will have a quick idea about uh, what are you having or what do you present or what do you like or what was it your research was about. And then we come to the sweet and sometimes scary part, but most likely the things that softwares that you will be having to deal with every single day in most of the either academically or uh, practically we'll have the microsoft word for writing specifically for writing reports for adding pictures to your uh, to your document most of the documents worldwide around the world will always be composed and written into, uh, into microsoft words application uh, then again, if you have, for example, you major in engineering, like for, uh, most of us are, or any other finance, for instance, or anything that deals with numbers, we have Microsoft Excel, 
we can make charts, we can make pictures, we can make, uh, but mostly charts, statistics, calculations, tables, all of those kind of inf uh, informations can be better executed into Excel. Uh, then finally presenting your uh, hard work, your research, and you would like to show everyone what you've done so far. And you would like to show them how did you do it and why you're interested about it. And maybe you will get someone hooked on it. We use Microsoft uh, PowerPoint for uh, these kind of uh, uh, presentations where it's basically a soft copy of slides. Each slide it can either contain text, pictures, or sometimes even short videos in order to be visually presented to the people. Uh, these are the most common ones you will find throughout the world. There are many other alternatives. Some are free, some are paid. And uh, for example, different operating systems will use different ones. Like for example, these are the most, uh, let's say common even in the in Windows and in the Mac operating system by Apple, even though they have their own proprietary uh, softwares, but mostly we all know and we've grown up using these free softwares. And in order to use them, uh, let's say efficiently and well, there are some skills needed. Uh, although it varies on how you're going to use it and why you're going to use it. But some of those skills are language. Uh, the more you improve your language, the more audience you can reach. The better you use your language, the better it reaches, the better it's understood, the better it makes an effect. Then you have the uh, search and reference the relevant material. Uh, how to find the information that you seek and how to present it. Is there any standard in presenting that material? Identifying and trying to find the item you really need, the item that will be useful to you, and referencing that item, matter, or subject, or topic to the key person, to the author who did it, is a key item in terms of academically uh, speaking, in terms of research and books. Uh, it's considered a crime taking information and researches from other people and not saying that, oh, this person A or person B, uh, they made this or they made that, they contributed here, they contributed there. Uh, so please, uh, when doing the research, please be careful of how uh, you present those information. And one of the main issues we have currently in universities and even through my days is that some people will come write a report or write a small essay or write a research and they'll take copy paste for a whole paragraph of information sometimes not even understanding what's inside that uh, paragraph so please be careful on how you research your items and how you present them to the people and uh, as well as referencing them to their authors because those people they have had the uh, time they took their time uh, they took their uh, expertise in order to finish some sort or to find some sort of information or some sort of something that will help the others or help the audiences all around. Then uh, creativity and professionalism. How creative are you going to be in using those items? Specifically, for instance, uh, Microsoft PowerPoint. How are you going to present it? What kind of colors do you like? What kind of pictures are you going to add? What kind of text font are you going to use? Maybe some fonts are, are more attractive than the others, depending on who your authors are. And in terms of professionalism, which is strictly speaking, uh, in terms of language and moderation, we cannot have words, jargons, or things, let's say, the words we use with our brothers and sisters and our friends. It's, it's better not to put them in these sorts of uh, documentations, for example, or in terms of presentations, as most likely you will use these sorts of documentations or presentations in front of uh, professional people, whether engineers or bosses, for example, clients. So please be careful on the type of language you use in terms of jargon and the silly words we use every now and then, and uh, whether it's in Arabic, of course, and in English. Then basic computer knowledge to understand the softwares, how are you going to use it and how 
does it uh, work? How can you write? How can you delete? How can you add a picture, graph, all those sorts of information? And you can find much, much more tutorials, many more on YouTube regarding each and every software and how are you going to work through it. And again, uh, the basic understanding of writing in terms of the standards required, for example, if you're writing a research paper, your university, what kind of font or format or the way of writing they would like. Or for example, if it's in the work, okay, do you have any specific form to do this report or not at all? These are some sorts of uh, items that you need to consider during the communication composing, whether it's written or visually speaking. Then to summarize uh, our lecture today, I cannot stress enough that please, communication is really important for all of us. All of us, we communicate in a different manner, but it's your key to success. There are many other keys to success, but it's one of the most important, specifically in your uh, practical field, in your work with your colleagues, with your friends, with your bosses, with the client how you speak, how you present, how you show attention, how you show motivation, how you write your documents, it makes a difference. Improving it is like having uh, the world as a piece of cake in front of you, basically. Then again, uh, in terms of, uh, let's say, personal opinion and expertise, that there's two types of writing, writing into the practical field and writing into the academic field each have their own way of conveying information and the audience are most likely into different uh, are different in terms of their scientific knowledge academic knowledge expertise so you need to be careful are you going to give it to your colleagues for example at work or this is for example for our beloved doctors at university for instance then think of the audience who will be receiving the information. For instance, old people, for example, they like numbers and professional people, they like numbers. They like too many statistics. The statistics show that, for instance, or represent that you've done your work correctly, that you've given something good. Who are your audience and what do you do or what do they need is something to always consider when doing either visually or presenting the uh, visually presenting or writing uh, any sort of document, for instance. Then the language. Please be careful while using the language, whether in Arabic or English. Each and every workplace or academic place, they have their own sorts of language, and we have to use it moderately. And things we use outside of those, like for example, family slang and maybe some words. Uh, from different accents, for instance, like, for example, the uh, Saudi Arabic, the Egyptian Arabic, the uh, Bahraini Arabic. Uh, please be careful not to use those, especially in professional documentation, your emails and communication. And finally, all of us can improve in communication and tactics. It takes time, but you'll find the fun in it. And it will be the key to your success. And I'd like to thank you all for your precious time. And I'm open to any questions and hearing from my uh, junior students. And thank you very much, Dr. Onay. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Ahmed. Uh, so you. if anyone has any question, please go ahead. You can uh, ask him. He's here. Okay, before that, uh, Ahmed, can you go to the, the very first slide, the title slide you, which you were showing? Sure. This is the one. Yeah, okay. So, uh, two things everybody can uh, note down. First of all, he finished on time, which is something which I can learn from. <laughs> and secondly, uh, it's his presentation, okay? I just had a quick look, look at it and still you see my name at the bottom. Okay, so... Uh, and this is this is something unique about Ahmed that that he is very particular about uh, his presentation and his reports. Thank you. So that's much, why I asked him to, you know, uh, to have some some time with us. So anyone else has any question? Please go ahead. Yes, doctor. Yes, Ahmed. Go ahead. 
Uh, I don't have a question. I just want to thank Mr. Ahmed. And thank you. I swear, really, really, we didn't feel the time. <laughs> it's passed. Yeah, <laughs> it's passed. Yeah, so quickly. I thank hope you, you enjoyed and learned maybe even yes. like one new item today. Yeah, we and really so enjoyed it. It's my pleasure to speak to you all. Thank you, Mr. Ahmed. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? Our students are becoming shy, doctor. Uh -huh. Corona has passed and they still haven't figured out the uh, Zoom and make it. <laughs> what can we say? Okay, uh, one one more thing from uh, my side. Uh, yeah, sure. You know, uh, so, uh, you know, uh, like how much time uh, like how often do are you you know involved with the report writing and uh, presentation and this sort of stuff like in terms of proportion of your time like how much time you spend on these things in terms of my let's say uh, influence or uh, let's say getting into those items it's mostly daily basis mm -hmm. you have to read reports write emails uh, communicate with many people and uh, it's it's like a daily task specifically the eight hours of work those are the most ones where you will have to work a lot depending on the document for instance that i'm working on like for, let's say for example a daily report would take like 10 minutes uh, an email would, would take like for example a minute uh, if it's a method of statement it might take two days of like okay. so let's say 16 hours because you'll have to put pictures, specifications, and stuff. In terms of academic, if you remember, we had to, I had to write the uh, thesis in around mm -hmm. three months, which was like 100 pages, but for the information, the sequencing, the, uh, the presentation, the corrections, for instance, the grammatical errors, and reviewing multiple times, and uh, making so, sorting out the whole uh, research, it took around three to four months, if I remember correctly before we even submitted it to the uh, committee. So it depends, but I would say communication is something that we're all influenced by, by the minute. Whether at home or at work, every day, some, you have to use some sort of communication skill. Okay, okay, okay. So just I wanted to highlight the importance of, uh, importance of this aspect. Normally we feel that if you know the technical stuff, that's enough. Uh, but it goes it goes beyond that actually. Because for instance, like I have, uh, let's say, uh, uh, I have, uh, uh, I had today concrete pouring at my site. Uh, concrete comes in different shapes and sizes, different strength and different weaknesses. For example, and chemicals. Uh, in order to order this concrete, we have to sit down, for example, with our quality control uh, engineers, and they have mm -hmm. had to show us their documentation, how do they prepare it, and we have to submit it officially to Saudi Aramco uh, via a submittal documentation. We have to uh, write how it's created, how it's uh, mixed, what are the proportions of the mixture, and uh, what kind of structures it can be used on. It's very technical. Not all of us could understand everything, but it's something that we need to understand at least when ordering the concrete. Ordering the concrete for the wrong structure or the wrong member with the wrong specifications can cause catastrophes. Your buildings can fall down if you're not sure of the type of concrete you're using. Roofs yeah. are different concretes than uh, uh, ground floors, than... Uh, for instance, beams, columns, uh, lean concrete, for instance. So having an idea or giving some kind of uh, technical aspect for whatever the, uh, the category is of communication, it's always welcomed. Mm -hmm. And it's good to try to understand the point of views of other people, regardless of their communication skills. Try to put yourself in that location, uh, in that specific, in his shoes, for instance. What does he think 
and what is he trying to tell you? If you figure it out and you understand the aspects of what he is trying to tell you, the communication will go smoothly and you will minimize any conflict that will arise so that everything will be in your favor and in his favor as well. So it will be a win-win situation. Okay, okay. Thank you so much. Uh, anyone else has any questions? Okay, okay. So, uh, Ahmed, uh, thank you so much for thank giving you us much. your time and your thank efforts. You. And uh, I, I know you must have uh, spent uh, some time on preparing this presentation as well. It's so, my pleasure. Uh, thanks for all that. And inshallah, uh, we'll be in touch. Okay. Sure, sure, and, of course. Uh, I'll be sharing this uh, presentation with the other sections as well. So, I hope you don't mind. No problem at all, Doctor. Okay, okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Zanawaya. Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum assalam.